I watched from an upstairs window through the shivering poplars as old Mrs. Next Door's fool gardener watered her hydrangeas. She rocked her chair on the same spot that I always sought when in pursuit of her, which was frequent, and of late, I'm thinking of finding a way to rid myself of the cause of that pursuit. <coughs> my little wife inquired of my glumness over her coffee cup, and I feigned an ankle pain, which prompted a drone of her concern. Since when has it been bothering me? When should she make an appointment with my physician? Never. But of course, I answered with all the pleasant ways of a loving husband, and so she doted on me and set my cup aside to leave a slick trail of disgusting maroon kisses. As to what occasioned my foul mood, I shall tell it. Last night, as my wife and I sat in the dim glow of the dining room, she suggested we move to New Jersey. Why, of all the sense in the world, I could not fathom what caused her little brain to suggest such a notion. I had been withholding her attack since a little while now. Let's go to Vegas in the autumn. Wouldn't it be swell if we joined a so-and-so course at the so-and-so institute? <clears throat> but the truth of it all is that I could not openly disagree with my missus. Despite her persistent claims of the violence of, of her affections, the violence she possessed in the running of the household frightened me. I may seem a coward, but gentlemen of the jury, if you could but witness her pouts and fainting spells and her prowess in the art of manipulation, you shall judge not so severely. And besides, I confess to being a very affectionate man. It pains me to deny anyone, lest of all, the old witch next door's lovely daughter. Why, she is the very cause that ignites me to resist a beaten feeble attempt. My loving wife rides down my spine. And as I am the master of the discreet, our passionate love affair is concealed behind the chase wheel of tutoring my ambitious neighbor, away from the dim knowledge of my wife. As much convinced I was that I could not rebel against my wife, last night I also became aware that the only way to end her schemes was her destruction. But before I am pronounced my capital punishment, let me explain how wonderfully fate sided with me. Oh, for why would it not? So as we descended the stairs and I held his stubby fingers of the many rings, Bitter Hill screamed its counsel to aid a trip that would send him flying down. But I am no killer, and I would not act, and the screaming ebbed to groans. She led me outside for the mere sake of fresh air. The lady opposite our house called to my wife and disappeared inside. My sweet wife told me she would join me shortly. Standing amidst the populace for company and the thirsty sun as the only witness, I saw a pickup truck turn into our street. The rest of what happened did so suddenly that even recalling it brings upon the most miserable headache. And let us not revisit all the bloody mess of the business. The next thing I found myself alive to was standing in a street full of people and policemen attempting to take notes. The vehicle had climbed the slanted lawn of the house opposite and had dragged my poor wife in its wake, her head a porridge of bones. I was ushered inside by friends and the next <coughs> few days passed under the sweet vigilance of the next door's daughter. My display of grief was so profuse that they even promoted her visits out of fear I might commit suicide. The one thing that bothers me is Mrs. Next Door's eyes upon me as if she's keeping a secret. But jolly be fit. The poor thing is too frail to be understood. Just one of these days, I fear I may tire of her rocking just right next door. Thank you so much. Rounds of quick fire questions and half wit advice were shot Rustam's direction, and he couldn't palm them off. He needed to shoot up in silence and think. But that bleeping new kid, he had thrown his world off axis. Rustam had kept him under it long enough, a gaze which the hardest nut nuts had cracked under. But he had nothing on this punk. No clue what he was after or why. No idea about why he didn't stick with what he had. Pills, booze, chicks. And not even an inkling of why the kid had accepted Rustam's <coughs> offer, especially since it was stacked for him to refuse. Rustam couldn't just turn the kid down, not at this stage. Shit would look weak. No, he needed, oops, he needed some way of turning the situation around. And no one told him how exactly. Not that he expected a nugget of sense from anyone in earshot. Rustam was left feeling woozy, needing to un unwind. Except he couldn't count on much relaxation time in the midst of those surround sound murmurs. 
It's like I'm in a restaurant, he scowled. So he had nowhere else to turn. His, eye, his eyes zeroed in on the stash jar, resting harmlessly on the table. A few precious shots were all that remained. He wrestled with the thought of using up the little left and was verging on being safe rather than sorry. <coughs> then a memory, flash. Sham had missed call earlier, meaning next month's package was on its way. And Rustam gave. He scraped the jar's bottom, licked his fingers down to the knuckles, dug around for some tin foil and a lighter. In between, <coughs> he had made up his mind. The dose would be up soon as the next package arrived. Shaggy and Co. would just have to cope with that. Akal de shimle uche hunde, be akali de guche hunde. Akal de shimle uche hunde, be akali de guche hunde, jede mitti roll jandene, oho moti suche hunde. The chute rabbi mel jandene. Chute rabbi mel jandene, evi suche muche hunde. Akal de shimle uche hunde. थाई थाई लड़दे फिरदे शेर काबिले गौर थाई थाई लड़दे फिरदे नैन लफंगे लुच्चे हुंदे अकल दे शिमले उच्चे हुंदे ते तोड़ निभाण दी गल दे अद्दे तोड़ निभाण दी गल दे अद्दे कॉल करार भी गुच्चे हुंदे और आखरी शेर है नीवे अंदरो होण विकास नीवे Andro Horn Vakas Baron Jede Uche Hunde Akal de Shimle Uche Hunde Bayakli de Uche Hunde. I've seen many generations pass by. I've been living with my great grandchildren. They've given me this big old room to live in, kind of like a dining room of sorts. They own a spiffy old place my folks couldn't imagine living in back in the day. I had the honor of being head of the table each night. I attended all the luncheons, the dinner parties, and all that jazz. I didn't change my style much. Listening to the conversations during these events was thoroughly enjoyable. My great-grandson, Harry, was the blue cheese of the place, you see, so he was traveling around the clock. One such night, his wife came home from a bar, drunk as a skunk, with a man she brought along. I was stunned. The shameless woman had brought home a Negro the sort of fellow who looked like he was on the lamb, and lord the things they did. I never liked her since the day I first laid my eyes on her. It was in this room during the engagement party. The dumb Dora obviously didn't know I was watching, and the kids weren't home either. Late in the night, after she fell asleep on the couch, the Negro drew out a gun and he shot her through the head. It was like a scene from the Vikings, the one from the 50s with Douglas in it. I was petrified. All choked up, and I didn't know what, and, and, and I didn't dare to move. Feeling so paralyzed and helpless was horrid. He walked down the room, began to slip the most expensive decorations, heirlooms, and paintings into a big brown bag. That's when he saw me. And with a sly look, the bastard dragged me with him too, and he bagged me. I tried to scream for help, but I couldn't do it. I don't know where I am now at some old yard sale, in a box with all these other paintings. Silly kids keep smearing up my paint. My velvet gown looks stained already. Thank you. When I talked to myself in kindergarten, my teacher found me nestled between crayons and towers of neatly stacked voodoo drawings, darting to find the perfect color, saying, mm, mommies? feed their babies through the belly button. That's why I have one, but they cry. I cried because I came out of my mommy's mouth. My mother was called to school that day. The teacher explained that I had been stammering a lie and it needed fixing. I needed fixing, so my mother halted my stammer in its tracks and didn't hold back when she said, with a head that big, you never would have left my body, darling. Two, the gold 
of the sun is painful to me. I'd rather let the margala exhausted monsoon wind subtend over its study of yellow and blue to give me gray, which once made me cry because the color wheel said green was right, and I'd rather let my scarf dampen under the rain of a lightning mustachioed sky bellowing a thunderous roar of victory. My melanin levels couldn't dampen me on stormy days. Three, there are more shades of brown escapades and comma curves in my hair than my body can even dream of showing. Four, the thin line between modesty and honesty vanished the day I met company and envy and perhaps uncertainty as well. The last seems to persevere the most, but I was taught to be an excellent host to guests and their remnants, especially when they planned on staying. <laughs> ਉਹ ਤਨ ਖਾਲ ਕਜ਼ਾਤ ਕਦੀਮ ਕੋਂ ਤਨ ਹਾਦਸ ਖਲਕ ਜਾਨ ਕੋਂ ਉਹ ਤਨ ਮੁਤਲਕ ਮਹਿਸ ਵਜੂਦ ਕੋਂ ਤਨ ਅਲਮੀਆ ਆਇਆਨ ਕੋਂ ਅਰਵਾ ਨਫੂਸ ਅਕੂਲ ਕੋਂ ਅਸ਼ਬਾ ਇਆਨ ਨਿਹਾਨ ਕੋਂ ਤਨ ਐਨ ਹਕੀਕਤ ਮਾਹੀਅਤ ਤਨ ਅਰਸ ਸਿਫਤ ਤੇ ਸ਼ਾਨ ਕੋਂ ਅਨਵਾ ਕੋਂ ਸਾ ਕਹੂੰ ਅਤਵਾਰ ਕਹੂੰ ਓ ਜ਼ਾਨ ਕਹੂੰ ਓ ਤਨੂੰ ਅਰਸ਼ ਕਹੂੰ ਅਫਲਾਕ ਕਹੂੰ ਤਨੂੰ ਨਾਜ਼ ਨਹੀਮ ਜਨਾਨ ਕਹੂੰ ਤਨੂੰ ਤਤ ਜਮਾਤ ਨਬਾਤ ਕਹੂੰ ਹੈਵਾਨ ਕਹੂੰ ਇਨਸਾਨ ਕਹੂੰ ਓ ਤਨੂੰ ਬਾਦਲ ਬਰਖਾ ਕਾਜ ਕਹੂੰ ਤਨੂੰ ਬਿਜਲੀ ਤੇ ਬਾਰਾਨ ਕਹੂੰ ਤਨੂੰ ਆਪ ਕਹੂੰ ਤਨੂੰ ਖਾਕ ਕਹੂੰ ਤਨੂੰ ਬਾਦ ਕਹੂੰ ਨੀਰਾਨ ਕਹੂੰ ਤਨੂੰ ਦਸਰਤ ਲਿਚ ਮਨ ਰਾਮ ਕਹੂੰ ਤਨੂੰ ਸੀਤਾ ਜੀ ਜਾਨਾਨ ਕਹੂੰ ਬਲਦੇਵ ਜਸੂਦਾ ਨੰਦ ਕਹੂੰ ਤਨੂੰ ਕਿਸ਼ਨ ਕਨਈਆ ਕਾਨ ਕਹੂੰ 